Uh, hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is I want to look at the spinning water bucket problem. Alright, if you've been to a natural science museum, it might look like the image that I've described here. Right? If you ever see a setup like this of color-filled fluid inside a container and that's sitting on a rotating platform, go ahead and give it a spin. And what you're going to notice is that that fluid doesn't stay flat, but instead it takes on this very, very well-defined shape shape. Okay, so today what I want to do is I want to describe the shape of the fluid. I did this in one of my classes. I used uh, this container here. I filled it with water. I placed it on a turntable and I rotated this fluid here inside this container all right, at some angular frequency omega. And have a look at my video of what I did. I didn't spin it too fast because it was only sitting on the platform and I didn't want it to spill over. But you can see again now this one's not rotating too fast, so the shape is just kind of slightly concave like that. But let's go ahead and look at the physics, the free body diagram, our equations of motion, and then get an equation that describes this shape. All right, like all of my videos, uh, consider giving it a like if you like the video, and if you like what I do on my channel, consider subscribing. Okay, let's get started. So in this tutorial, uh, really what we're doing is we're gonna spin this fluid and we're gonna describe its shape once it reaches this equilibrium shape. Okay, so we're gonna spin it about the z-axis here. We're spinning this entire object. We're spinning all of that fluid, and eventually all of the fluid behaves like a solid, right? Everything is moving together as one. So this is really what we wanna do. And before you get it to spin, remember you have a certain level of water in that container, right? And that level of water is probably somewhere around here, right? And all of this is filled with fluid initially. Now that volume is stuck inside that container. So all we're doing is just changing the shape, but the overall volume must remain the same because none is spilling out the edges. Okay, so that's gonna be an important thing to consider at the end. All right, so let's look at the free body diagram now. We're going to consider a single droplet that is at the surface of a spinning fluid, right? It's going around in a circle, therefore there have to be forces acting on it. So let's look at the forces, set up Newton's laws, and solve them in order to obtain the shape. At the end, we have to conserve the total amount of volume inside that container. And that's gonna be an important point to fully describe the shape of that fluid. All right, so what we're first gonna do here is we're going to consider, again, this fluid has been spinning for a little bit and it's achieved this shape. And what I wanna do is I wanna consider one particular water droplet. It doesn't matter which one you pick. You can pick this one, you can pick one here, as long as it's at the surface, okay? So I'm gonna pick this one. Now the shape of this water droplet trajectory has to be a circle, right? It basically traces out a circle of a particular radius. Okay, so it's undergoing uniform circular motion. Uh, that circle you can characterize with a particular radius from the axis of rotation. So that's important. Uh, the next thing we have to do is label all the forces acting on it. Okay, so first of all, uh, Earth is pulling straight down on that water droplet because it has a mass. M, therefore the force acting on it is its weight. Uh, Mg, all right, Earth pulling down on it. Now, the other force, which is also important now is, again, if we have a surface, and imagine this water droplet is just right at the surface, then there is a force from the rest of the fluid on this water droplet. And that force right there would be like any other surface force, right? It's a force that acts perpendicular to the surface. I'm gonna call that a normal force, right? That's typically what we call it. Now that normal force, again, it's perpendicular to the surface. So right here, I'm gonna draw a line that is perpendicular to the normal force. And let's define an angle over here, right? Because that shape has a certain curve, at least right here, I can describe that by some angle theta. Notice that if I picked a droplet that was closer to this point, right, that angle theta would be a lot smaller than if I consider one where I currently have it. So that's it, right? So we have a droplet going around in a circle. Guess what? You should know the direction of the acceleration of that droplet, right? That droplet has to be accelerating toward the center of the circle, right? Because it is uniform circular motion, and this is a centripetal acceleration problem. 
So let's go ahead now and define a coordinate system. This is going to be my coordinate system. Positive y is going up. And I know that toward the center of the circle, that's typically how I solve circular motion problems. I also define that to be the positive direction. I'm going to call this the positive x direction. All right, let's go ahead and write down Newton's second law now for this problem. All right, just before we write down Newton's second law, let's go ahead and just write down actually this angle theta because I have to break one of these forces down into components. And actually, if I look at this coordinate system, it's really the normal force that I want to break down. So let's define this direction here to be uh, perpendicular to this one, right? So we have kind of a right angle there. Now, you should be able to convince yourself that if this here is an angle theta, uh, this angle right here should also be an angle theta. And that's really important. All right, at this point, then it's pretty straightforward. So we're going to have the sum of the forces in the vertical direction, if I add them all up, those ones should be equal to zero, right? Because you should have a balance of the forces. The particle's not moving up or down. There's no acceleration in the vertical direction. So the way that that looks like now, well, there's really two forces acting in this vertical direction. There's the weight acting down, and there is one component of the normal force acting up. So it should look something like this, Fn, but it's not all of Fn, it's Fn cos of the angle theta, okay? And then minus the weight, minus mg, uh, that there should be equal to zero. All right, this is equation one. Uh, what else we have? Well, let's look at the sum of the forces now along the direction that is acting toward the center of the circle. In this case, there is really only one force, right? It is the component of the normal that's acting toward the center of the circle, right? Keep in mind, this is what we have. I mean, let's just redraw it just to be crystal clear about this, right? We've got uh, this component of the normal force. This was my vertical, Fn cos of the angle theta. And we're going to have a component like this acting toward the center of the circle. The angle theta is this one right here. Um, so this component should be Fn sine of the angle theta. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. So there is only one component, Fn sine of the angle theta. Well, that's not equal to zero. There's only one force that has to be equal to Ma, except in this case, it's going around in a circle. So it's the centripetal acceleration. Now, you should remember from uh, your kinematics that the centripetal acceleration takes on a very specific value. Right? It's v squared over the radius. And in this case, I've called the radius lowercase r. So let's go ahead now. If you go ahead and you substitute that right in here, uh, what you're left with is this should be m uh, v squared over r. All right, so this is going to be equation 2. All right, let me go ahead and just rewrite these a little bit differently, not too much. Okay, let me start with equation 2 right here. I uh, just want to line them up nicely because I want to show you the mathematical step we're going to do. So this is Fn sine of theta. And this here has to be equal to m uh, v squared over little r. That was equation two. And let's go ahead and do equation one right underneath it, except I'm going to bring the weight on the other side. So we have Fn cos of the angle theta. And this here equals to mg. And that was equation one, basically, right? I've just brought this term to the other side. All right, I'm going to do two important steps right here. I'm not really interested in the normal force here. So you see I've got the normal force in both of these equations. Uh, one way to eliminate that is to simply take equation 2 and divide it by equation 1. So that's what it looks like, right? And if I do that, well, look what we have. Um, Fn sine of theta divided by Fn uh, cos of theta. And look what happens over here. The mass terms will cancel out, right? Because you're going to have mv squared over little r for equation 2. And then you're dividing by the weight. Uh, the weight I could just write like this, right? So let's cancel a few things out. First of all, we have that the normal force here cancels out, so that's convenient. The other thing we have is that the mass cancel out. And one thing you should notice is right here, I have a sine over a cos. So guess what we have for this final equation right here, which is super important, okay? Tangent of this angle theta. Again, that's the angle theta that the fluid makes kind of relative to the horizontal, okay? So that's telling us something. Equals to V squared over little r, and then there's also little g in there. 
All right, so let's have a look at this equation. Actually, there's so much physics contained in this equation here, but if you can get right here, you're pretty much 50% done the problem. The rest will just be a little bit more math, but we've done a lot of the physics right here by obtaining this equation. Right, so we're gonna make a uh, look at this equation for just a second right here. What happens first of all if V is zero, right? Uh, if we have V is zero, um, that means that the right-hand side equals to zero. That means that my angle theta uh, would also be equal to zero. And that's true, right? That means if the angle theta is equal to zero, it means it's a flat fluid, right? So that kind of makes sense. It's kind of a little check you can make. Now, I don't really like having it in terms of V because depending on which particle you choose, V will be different, right? Because uh, this one here only does a small circle. This one near the top over here un does a bigger circle in the same amount of time. Right, so let's keep in mind that you know there have different distances, different circumferences for those circle. However, they all have the same omega right here. So it's kind of useful to describe it in terms of omega. So again, if you have a radius r and something here is going at speed v, um, spinning at a angular rate, those are related to each other, right? You should remember that from your class, just from kinematics you have r omega right here. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to uh, substitute v here for r omega. And let's take this equation one step further. I haven't changed tangent of theta. Uh, however, I do change this. This is r omega squared. However, I'm still dividing by rg. You can see there's gonna be r's in the numerator and denominator. So um, at the end, really what you wanna do is eliminate one of those r. So you're gonna have r in the numerator now, omega squared over g. Okay, so this is really what tangent of theta equals to. So this one is an imp also an important step because this is kind of nice because each water droplet now has the same omega. They do have different radii, but uh, that's okay. We're gonna deal with that in just a minute. All right, now we go into some calculus. All right, to take this to the next level now, we have to do a little bit of calculus. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna really zoom in to this water droplet right here. So let me go ahead and kind of redraw it. I have the angle theta, which is kind of this angle right here, it's relative to the horizontal direction. Okay, and if you imagine now, we take some infinitesimal distances. What is the angle theta or tangent of the angle theta? What's well, really, Again, it's going to involve this distance and also the vertical distance, right? Um, this distance here is kind of a uh, delta radius, right? This is in the radial direction. And this guy here is the change in the height, call that maybe delta Z, right? If I want tangent of the angle theta here, which is inside, I can write tangent of the angle theta this is really nothing more than the slope of the line, okay? Uh, this is the slope, and the slope you can write as delta Z over, oops, delta R. All right, and the limit that you take some very, very small elements right here, it really tends toward DZ over DR when you really take an infinitesimal limit. Okay, so that is the definition of the slope. And the slope here has to be equal to the right-hand side of my equation, which is omega squared over g. I'm just gonna switch the order. I'm gonna put r right here in the back. All right, so this is the equation we really wanted to solve for now right here, is that as long as we're looking for a function of z as a function of the radius, right? And we're told that the slope is equal to this value right here. So what you have to do now is simply bring the dr on the other side, and then you have to integrate in order to get what this function is. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So this is what it looks like. It looks like dz is equal to omega squared uh, g r multiplied by dr. All right, and the way you solve this now is you simply integrate, okay, you integrate this entire function. This goes from zero all the way to the radius of uh, this water droplet, right? So this is gonna go all the way to, let's call it, uh, I'll use the, call it r prime, that's fine. At the end, it really doesn't matter. This is just really a dummy variable. And this here is going to go from, well, from some initial height to some final height, which is really what we're trying to find. 
Okay, uh, the left-hand side of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is z minus z naught. Okay, and this side over here, again, if you remember some integration, this is omega squared uh, g. Now, this is simply integrating r dr, which is r squared over 2. And again, that's going from 0 all the way to the final radius. Okay, so the last step here is z minus z0 is equal to omega squared uh, g. And you can substitute r prime in there, so you get r prime squared uh, over 2. All right, now whether you call it r prime or you go back to r is just kind of a, a mathematical thing, so I'm just going to call it r. All right, so our last step now, let's just bring the z naught on the other side, and we have my final equation right here. So z equals to z0, or z naught, plus omega squared divided by g. This is a constant, right? Depends on how fast I spin it. And I'll put the 2 here in the front of the little g, and I'm left with this functional dependence of r squared. Wow, this is really the end of it. Okay, this is my goal that I was really trying to find. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this equation in more detail. All right, so we have our equation. Now, a couple uh, important points to consider for this equation. First of all, it's the r squared term. This means that the shape is a parabola, or it's a parabolic shape. Okay, so that describes the relationship right here. Uh, the other term that is also important here is this term, right? The z naught, and z naught basically just describes a parabola that's been shifted uh, upward by some height z naught. So this is really uh, our height z naught. Now, remember what I told you is that initially this is what happens when it's spinning at some angular frequency. But initially, what we had was some water, which was I don't know, maybe it was like at this level, right? This is when omega equals to zero, okay? When omega equals to zero, we have some height h. And then we start spinning it. The water on the edges goes up. The water at the center point goes down to form this nice parabola. But it basically tells us that uh, this in height here of the water has to be somehow related to uh, the height. But we have to figure out how much, okay? What is that functional dependence here? And basically, the more I spin it, the higher goes on the edges and the lower this gets, okay? But all that must be related to how much water I had in the container, okay? So in order to find this relationship here, what we're going to do is take this a little bit further and look at the conservation of mass, all right, of fluid, all right? If we consider that there's still the same amount of water inside, whether it's spinning fast or not spinning at all, um, we can actually get this relationship. So let's do that part of the calculation just to end the video. All right, so in order to take this to the next level here, what we're going to do is we're going to assume we have a cylinder, okay? Um, and initially we have a certain height of uh, the water, okay? Uh, again, all of the mass or the volume has to be uh, the same, right? When it's spinning and it's not spinning. So let's look at before it spins, right? When omega is zero, uh, before it spins, the total mass inside the container, the mass, uh, has to be equal to, let's just call it m, okay? It's going to be the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of water right here. And the volume of water for a cylinder, um, it's going to be pi uh, r squared and multiplied by this height h. Now, I used uppercase r. Uppercase r is simply going to be the radius of this container. Okay, so this uh, bottom surface here has an area which is pi r squared, and that initial height is h. Okay, now once we are reach some spin angular velocity here, what we're going to do is we have to find how much mass and where that mass is distributed. Okay, so let's write down that expression once we have omega. Okay, our mass expression has to be the same as the first one when it's not spinning. Again, you're going to have a density. Now, in order to find this, I need to find the volume, okay? And what we're going to do here is I'm going to split this up into shells, okay? So the shell right here is going to have a certain height. The height is going to be Z. And the thickness, uh, the thickness, let me do it in blue. The thickness right here is going to be DR, okay? 
Now remember, this does a circle, right? And when you integrate using the shell method, so the circumference of each one is basically 2 pi r, right? So let's have a look at this. So the mass now is going to be um, uh, the density. And now I'm going to have to add up all of these shells, right? I have to add up all of the shells from zero all the way to the radius. And for each one, it has a volume of 2 pi a little r, right? Because they're going to be a certain distance away from the origin. So this is the circumference. And what else? Multiplied by the height, right? Multiplied by the height, which is going to be z. And now each shell has a little thickness, which is dr, okay? So this is really nothing more than using the shell method in order to integrate the volume, okay? If you don't remember this from your calculus class, you may have to go review this. Now, remember, I'm going to use the expression I have for z right here. So let's go ahead and we got to work on this right hand side. So the mass has to be equal to the density. We're just going to substitute in that expression. This is nothing complicated. We have 2 pi r. Well, that's fine. And now instead of writing z, I'm going to substitute z naught is just the number plus omega squared over 2 little g r squared and dr. Okay, now we have to do some math. I could take out uh, the constant, which is 2 pi. So go ahead and do that right here. Um, we have our density multiplied by 2 pi. Okay, now we're going to have, I have to distribute this, okay? So it's going to be two terms to this integral here. First of all, it's going to be z naught, okay? That's the height once it's spinning, uh, multiplied by r, little r. And then the second term, again, it involves a bunch of constants, omega squared over 2g, and you have to multiply through right here. So you get kind of this r, cu uh, r cubed term. Yeah, r cubed, and everything here is multiplied by dr. All right, we have to do this integral now from 0 to r. This is pretty straightforward in terms of integration. If you're good at calculus, if you're not, you might struggle. Um, so again, the first term is going to do like this, z naught. Once I substitute the limits of integration, this is going to be r squared over 2, okay? And then plus omega squared over 2g, those are the constant terms. And once you integrate r cubed dr, that becomes, and I substitute the limits. I'm doing this a little bit fast here because this is just a little bonus feature. All right, regardless, this is the expression you get for the mass of a spinning fluid. It has to be the same as the first expression that I have, which is way simpler. When you link both of those expressions, you're able to get an expression of z naught in terms of the height. Okay, and that was our goal. So let's go ahead and I'm going to do a little bit more math on the next page to wrap this up. All right, so I've set both masses equal to each other. So we have the mass when it's not spinning here on the left-hand side, and the more complicated expression for the basically the mass or the volume times the density under this parabola right here. All right, so let's go ahead and do some simplifications. We have density on both sides. We can simplify that term. And we have this pi, which can cancel out with that one. Um, notice we have a two here. If I bring that inside this parentheses, this two can cancel with that one. And that two will also eliminate this one right here. All right, so let's go ahead and well, maybe cancel out one more term. Look at the r squareds, right? I have r squared here, I have r squared here, and I have r to the four, but if I take out two of them, I'll be left with r squared. The nice thing about this is, look at I have h, okay? That's all that's left on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I have z naught, and then I have this other term here, which is plus uh, omega squared uh, divided by g, and this is r squared over four. All right, the last thing I want is I want to get z naught by itself. Okay, so z naught is equal to h, um, what else? Minus all of this term, omega squared, r squared divided by g over 4, 4g. Let's just switch those. All right, so have a look. Remember, this here is really describing what's happening at the center of the container, right? That is really what's happening over here. 
So if omega equals to zero, basically the second term goes away and Z naught is equal to H and that works out fine. What happens when I spin it faster, right? The faster I spin it, this second term gets bigger. That means that Z naught, if I spin it super fast, right? You're gonna have fluid that goes like this. At the top, it actually has to be higher. The first, so I didn't draw that properly. But you can see that this height gets smaller when you spin faster. Right, Z naught gets smaller when omega gets bigger, right? Because I start taking away. Now there is a point where Z naught goes to zero, right? If you think about it, when does Z naught equal to zero? Well, Z naught equals to zero when you can get a function for omega and it's kind of like the maximum value, right? If you think about it, right? So our maximum omega for this problem um, it's when Z naught goes to zero. So I'm gonna set zero right here. And this is um, H minus omega squared R squared over four G. And really I'm gonna put an M there because that really represents the maximum omega I can have. All right, do a little bit of math. You're gonna find that the maximum value of omega here, which is also kind of interesting is, again, I'm just gonna rearrange it in a nice compact form, but you're basically just solving this equation here, a little bit of algebra over g multiplied by height, okay? If I spin it at this, basically I no longer, right? <laughs> I've basically pushed this lower level, the lowest point in that fluid to zero, and I really don't no longer have a nice parabolic shape anymore because there's no fluid now at that midpoint, okay? So that's also kind of a nice uh, result you can get from here by using conservation of mass. All right, folks, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this uh, clarified some aspects of this problem.